Good evening, everyone. This is Wayne from the Alchemical Tech Revolution YouTube channel. Tonight, we're going to discuss the Jesuits. Who are the Jesuits, and uh, what are they all about? Uh, tonight, we're going to actually read uh, the introductory chapter of the book titled Secret Instructions of the Jesuits, faithfully translated from the Latin of an old genuine London copy with an historical sketch by W.C. Brownlee, D.D., of the Collegiate Reformed Dutch Church, New York, American and Foreign Christian Union, 156 Chamber Street, a few doors west of the Hudson River Railroad Depot. Copyright 1857. And this is an 1857 um, manuscript. Uh, it was a rewrite. It was originally translated from the Latin of actually uh, some books that were found uh, from the Jesuits in their various uh, universities and such uh, that was actually called the Secret Instructions of the Jesuits and you'll understand what's going on when we read this introductory chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter. I'm not going to really pause and give you my thoughts in between or anything like I normally do because, well, let's just say this introductory chapter spells it all out for you in no uncertain terms as to who these people are what they're all about, and, uh, you know, what they have done historically, and why we are where we are today. And bear in mind, as we read this, that the current Pope is a Jesuit. Uh, so, let's just go ahead and get into this. All right, here we go. Historical sketch. Swear, forswear, and the truth deny. Jura perjura veritamique denega. And that is... Uh, labeled to be a Jesuit maxim, and that's a quote, just to start this all off. And now uh, we'll get into the history here. I'll start reading <coughs> in just a moment. Just going to clear my throat quick. Okay. The Society of the Jesuits was founded in 1540, just 11 years after the Christian Church had come out of the Roman sect and assumed the name of Protestants. The singular originator of the new order was Ignatius Loyola, a native of Biscay, he had, when a soldier, received a severe wound in the service of Ferdinand V of Spain in 1521, and he had been long confined in a place where he had access, probably, to no other books than the lives of the saints. It is not to be wondered at that his mind was thence turned away from military enthusiasm to ghostly fanaticism. When recovered, he speedily gave proofs of his insane fanaticism by assuming the name and office of Knight of the Virgin Mary. And like a good type of the future Don Quixote, he pursued with solemn gravity a course of the wildest and most extravagant adventures in the belief that he was her most exalted favorite. Having conceived the plan of a new monastic order, he submitted the constitution thereof to Pope Paul III, and he assured his infallibility and holiness that the plan and constitution were given to him by an immediate revelation from heaven. This he no doubt deemed necessary to be on a footing of equality with the other orders. For, as Dr. Stillingfleet had shown, every order of monks and nuns in Rome has been ordained by visions and inspirations from heaven. The Pope hesitated. Loyola took the hint and had another convenient inspiration, and added to the three usual vows of the monastic orders of chastity, poverty, and obedience a fourth vow, namely, absolute subservience to the Pope, to do whatever he enjoined, and go on any service he wished, and into any quarter of the globe. This the Pope could not resist, especially at a time when the Reformation had convulsed his seat and shaken his empire to the foundation. He accordingly issued his bull of confirmation and sent them out to invade the world. Their object was diverse from that of all the other orders. Monks profess to retire from the world and massacrate the body. The Jesuits set out to conquer the world to the Pope. The monks hoped to conquer the flesh, but they did it by acting contrary to the laws of nature and the gospel of Christ. The Jesuits aimed at a universal dominion over the souls and bodies of men, to bind them as vassals to the Pope's chariot wheels. The monks professed to combat in private the devil, the world, and flesh, although they did it in the exact way to make it themselves 
the slaves of the flesh and the devil. The Jesuits were the soldiers of the Pope. They knew no law but the will of their general, no mode of worship but the Pope's dictate, no church but themselves, and the mass god which their head at Rome set before them in the wafer was the idol of their adoration. They were also extremely indulgent to their heathen converts, the Chinese, for instance. They allowed them to continue the worship of their ancestors and light candles and burn incense before their images. They imposed on them no other burden than to give to these deceased Chinese the names of the Roman saints, such as St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Mary. These the converts had on their lips, while their hearts' homage was given to their ancestors. Thus... They converted them by stealth and saved them by deception and idolatry. Among the Indians of our great West, they not only sur suppressed the truths of Christianity, but devised the most infamous fictions and falsehoods. One of them assured a native chief that Jesus Christ was just a such a one as he would have admired. He was a mighty chief, a valiant and victorious warrior, who had in the space of three years scalped an incredible number of men, women, and children. Another, in the East Indies, produced a pedigree of himself in which he clearly demonstrated that he was a lineal descendant of Brahma. Brewster's Encyclopedia, Article Jesuit, Volume 11. Other papal orders were in a manner voluntary. At least their members had great liberties and were not in abject submission to their abbot or superior. But the sect of Jesuits were placed by Loyola, under a strict military and despotic government. In fact, the old wounded soldier took his laws and discipline from his military experience. Like the military chief, their general was chosen for life. To him, every member was sworn on the cross to yield an implicit obedience. Like the soldier, the Jesuit yielded up his body and soul and wishes and desires to his general. He had no right to consult a friend or exercise even his own judgment. The general's will was his will. He must go wherever their chief, residing at Rome, should dictate, be it into Asia or Africa or any portion of the globe. He put no questions. He asked no reasons. The general was his sovereign god. He sailed with sealed orders. He must teach, not what he believed to be right. He had no choice of his faith. He must believe as his general regulated his heart and soul and conscience. He must do any deed enjoined on him, asking no questions. He was not to shrink from any deed of blood. If the general enjoined, he must send the Spanish Armada to overthrow England. He must blow up the English Parliament with gunpowder. He must assassinate King Henry of France, or shoot the Prince of Orange, or poison Pope Ganganelli, or enjoin Charles the Ninth to perpetuate the St. Bartholomew Massacre, and Louis the Fourteenth to revoke the Edict of Nantes, and cover fair France with blood and havoc, and fill the nations with the lamentations of her miserable exiles. If he failed, he tried again and again. He stopped not short of his aim until it was either accomplished or he died on the rack, as did the assassin of the King of France. And if he did perish, he was sainted, as was Garnet, the Jesuit chief of the gunpowder plot, who is to this day worshipped as Saint Henry in Spain. The general had the uncontrolled right of receiving and dispersing their immense funds and made every nomination to office and removed any one he chose without assigning any reasons to any one. For although nominally under the Pope's power, the society exercised an unlimited power over the cardinals and even over the Pope. Money and Jesuit craft overcame all and enslaved all. They did what the kings of France did to the Pope and what Austria now is doing to his vassal, the Holy Father. They flattered and caressed the successor of St. Peter, while they tied up his hands and chained him in his chair of St. Peter. The whole society was divided by their general into 37 provinces, and a register lay before him containing the character of each novice and of each fully initiated member. His talent, his tact, his activity, his defects, everything relating to him. Hence the general had an accurate view of each instrument, in each field, ready for every emergency and task. 
The Jesuits had missionaries for the villages and martyrs for the Indians, says the writer of their history in Brewster's Edinburgh Encyclopedia. <coughs> Thus a peculiar energy was imparted to the operations of the, this most singular society. The Jesuits are a naked sword whose hilt is at Rome, but its blade is everywhere, invisible until its stroke is felt. They soon found their way into schools and sought most anxiously to gain the education of children, especially of Protestants. Their maxim was this, Give us the education of the children of this day, and the next generation will be ours. Ours in maxims, in morals, and religion. They found their way into colleges, into theological institutions, as at this day in Oxford and other places. They pretended to be converted and to enter into Protestant churches. They were found in the Reformed Church in France and Holland and caused grievous and fatal divisions by false doctrine. They were found in the rank of the old English Puritans. This was discovered by a letter from the Jesuit confessor of the King of England to the Jesuit confessor of Louis XIV. How admirably our people imitate the Puritan preachers, said he in this intercepted letter. They adapted themselves to all kinds of character. With the Jew, they were Jews to gain their object. With the infidel, they were skeptics. To the immoral, they were the most liberal and indulgent until they gained the absolute ascendancy over them. Hence they found their way into king's courts and queen's boudoirs. This sect gave confessors to the chief crowned heads of Europe. England, France, and the Waldenses under the house of Savoy felt this to their cost. It was an allusion to their utter disregard of morals, except where property and power were to be gained by a show of morals, that the Abbe Boulot said with great truth, they are a sort of people who lengthen the creed and shorten the moral law. And for want of room, I must, without quoting it, refer the reader to the almost prediction of Dr. Brown, Bishop of Dublin, in 1551, respecting their character, their aims, their deeds, and downfall. This is found in the Harleian Miscellany, Volume 5, page 566, and in Motium's Ecclesiastical History, Century 16, Section 3, Part 2. The success of this sect was at first very slow. In 1540, when the frantic Loyola petitioned the Pope for a bull to establish this new papal army, he had only ten disciples. He was in nearly as hapless a condition as his equally moral and equally Christian brother, Mohammed. But they surmounted every difficulty for a season by adapting their agents and members to every class, and particularly they gained applause and fame and wealth by cultivating, cultivating the arts and sciences, by diffusing the most extensive taste for the classics, by their additions in Usum Delphini for the instruction of the Dauphin as the young heir apparent to the French throne was then entitled. In fact, they soon supplanted every rival in the department of teaching. They seemed to gain the instruction of the youth in every European kingdom. They did for centuries exactly that which they are now attempting to do in the United States. They affected immense learning. All others knew nothing. They went in disguise into Protestant kingdoms and states. They set up schools or gained the academic chairs and the professional chair. They won over the youth to their cause. Their female Jesuits pursued the same course with the young and tender sex and made vast numbers of converts to their sect. And these Jesuit nuns did not waste their energies and exhaust their pious emotions in dungeon cells and the graded prisons, which the want of due gallantry on the part of laymen, even among us, allow the aspiring and licentious priests to build for women under their very eyes. No, they were out-of-door missionaries. They were known by the name of Sisters of Charity, Sisters of the Heart, and other sentimental and imposing names. They were female soldiers invading the sanctity of families, carrying captive silly women laded with iniquity and ignorance. They fought among females as did their desperate male brothers among the males in the community. Forty-eight years after their organization, that is in 1608, 
they had increased to the appalling number of nearly 11,000. Before the English Revolution of 1688, they had obtained the direction of the schools, academies, colleges, and universities in all the European Catholic continent, and they had the address to have their members installed confessors to the kings of Spain, France, Portugal, Naples, Austria, Sicily, and the regal duke of Savoy, and every leading prince and noble in these kingdoms. But they had driven on so furiously in their wild, ambitious, and bloody career that innumerable enemies were raised up against them. The Jansenists were their deadly enemies in France. Pascal's provincial letters, written with inimitable good humor and in the most elegant style, attracted all scholars and politicians to their dangerous morality, their atrocious principles in politics, and had inflicted a blow on the Jesuits from which they never recovered. Their disgrace took place first in France. They were dissolved and abolished in 1762 by the Parliament of France. And in this national act, the Parliament assigned the following as the reasons for their abolition. The consequences of their doctrines destroy the law of nature. They break all the bonds of civil society by authorizing theft, lying, perjury, the utmost licentiousness, murder, criminal passions, and all manner of sins. These doctrines, moreover, root out all sentiments of humanity. They overthrow all governments, excite rebellion, and uproot the foundation and practice of religion. And they substitute all sorts of superstitions, irreligion, blasphemy, and idolatry. Their overthrow in Spain was sudden and complete. At midnight, March 31st, 1767, a strong cordon of troops surrounded the six colleges of Jesuits in Madrid, seized the fathers, and before morning had them conveyed on the way to Carthagena. Three days after, the same prompt measures were pursued towards every other college in the kingdom. In a word, kingdom after kingdom followed up the same course of measures against these intolerable enemies of God and of men. They have been banished either partially or entirely no less than 39 times from the different kingdoms and states of Europe. And in 1773, Pope Garganella, Clement XIV, abolished the order entirely as a sect no longer to be endured by man. It will cost me my life, he said, but I must abolish this dangerous order. It did cost him his life. A few days after his bull was published against the Jesuits, a notice was placarded on his gate intimating that the see would soon be vacant by the death of the Pope. He died of poison within a few days of the time thus announced by their agency. He observed on his dying bed to those around him, I am going to eternity, and I know for what. Brewster's Encyclopedia, Volume 11, page 171. But... Although they were thus dissolved and abolished, they still kept up privately their organization. In the interim, from 1773 to 1801, their general resided at Rome publicly. In 1801, they were restored for some political reasons by the Emperor Paul in Russia. This seems almost incredible. But this bad man and infamous emperor needed the support of the worst of all the Roman Catholic orders. In 1804, the king of Sardinia, for the same reasons, restored them. In 1814, at the close of the late war, Pope Pius VII, who first crowned the emperor Napoleon and then ventured to excommunicate him, restored the order of Jesuits to their full powers and prerogatives in all particulars and called on all papal princes in Europe and the powers in South America and in all the establishments of popery to afford them protection and encouragement as the Pope's right arm and the superior and most successful instruments of extending Catholicism and pulling down all heresies. In that papal bull reviving this sect, the Pope, even in this enlightened day, utters his visionary claims in a style befitting the Dark Ages. He affirms that this, his act, is above the recall or revision of any judge with whatever power he may be clothed. He thus sets at defiance all the powers of all civil governments upon the earth. This order, being thus revived and covered with the shield of the Master of the Kings of the Earth, 
is now in active operation and has been attended for the last 20 years with the most appalling success in undermining the liberties of mankind, corrupting religion, sowing dissensions in the churches, and in aiding the Holy Alliance in throwing a wall of iron around their kingdoms to prevent the entrance and dissemination of liberal sentiments. Their labors extend to every papal and every Protestant kingdom and state in Europe and in South America, where they are the main cause of all these national convulsions and bloodshed in order to prevent and put down all republicanism. They are also most active in Great Britain and the United States, which above all other nations they are most anxious to win and woo over to papism. The revival of the Order of Jesuits by Pope Pius VII in the face of the bull of another equally infallible pope who had condemned them and abrogated them as a most pest, pestiferous and infamous sect exhibits a poor specimen of papal unity and infallibility, and the act of Pope Pius VII ought to have roused the indignation of all the friends of humanity, order, and liberty in Europe and America. The following are the sentiments of an able writer on this in the London Christian Observer, volume 14. What new witness has appeared to testify on behalf of Jesuitism? What adequate cause existed for its revival by a pope? If an instrument is wanted to quench the flame of charity and throw us back in the career of ages and sow the seeds of everlasting divisions and lay a train which is to explode in the citadel of truth and, if possible, overthrow her sacred towers, we venture confidently to affirm that Jesuitism is that very instrument." Until a proper reason be assigned other than this, we must conclude with our forefathers, with the kings and queens and parliaments and judges and churches of Europe, aye, and with the decisive bull of the infallible Pope Ganganelli, Clement XIV, that Jesuitism is a public nuisance and that he who endeavors and dares to let it loose upon civil society is actually chargeable with high treason against the common interests and happiness of the human family. See Brewster's Encyclopedia, Article Jesuits, Volume 11, page 172. Let me now advert briefly to the history of the following little book, which these statements are designed to introduce to our readers. The secret instructions formed a code of the laws of Jesuitism. They were not allowed to be made known even to many members of a certain class of Jesuits. They had bold, daring, bad men to achieve desperate deeds and take off their enemies by steel or bullet or poison chalice. These knew something that others did not. They had also disguised agents, men in mask. These Jesuits knew something not imparted to others of the same order. They had shrewd, crafty, courteous, and most polished men who courted nobles, insinuated themselves into the favor of princes, kings, and rich widows, and young heirs and heiresses. These had their instructions from their general. They had fine scholars, decent, steady, serious, moral men. These were not at all let into the secret of certain instructions. They were sent out as traps to captivate the serious, the unsuspecting, the religious. These had it in charge to give a captivating representation of their society of Jesus. These taught that they mingled in no politics, sought no riches, kept strictly their vow of poverty, their sole object was by the help of heaven to convert the world and put down Protestantism and all heresies. And in these details, these classes of this sect were honest, for they were not initiated into the secret instructions. And hence, they could, with an honest conscience, deny and even swear on the cross that no such instructions were ever given or ever received. And the initiated Jesuits took special care to push forward these decent, amiable, moral, and trustworthy men to declare to the world that no such rules and no such maxims of these, as these of the secret instructions ever existed among them. And from the high character of these men, their testimony was of great weight with kings, nobles, and even Protestants. This throws light upon the mystery and contradictory statements made by honest Jesuits and historians, and by Protestants. 
the profligate, the cunning, the daring, and all similar classes in this motley sect, with their general and the host of his spies crawling like the frogs and flying like the locusts of Egypt all over the land, were fully initiated into the secret of these instructions, and they acted on them every day. Hence the horrid marks of their footsteps of pollution and blood. In fact, these secret instructions were not discovered fully to the Christian public until some fifty years after the dissolution and expulsion of the society. But all ranks of men, papal and Protestant, who had studied the Jesuit movements, intrigues, and conspiracies were intimately acquainted with their practices. Hence, when the book of secret instructions was discovered and published, everybody at once saw the evidence of its authenticity. They had been long familiar with their conspiracies and practices. Here was the exact platform and model of all their actings. They who had felt and suffered under their atrocious morals and conspiracies against the cause of God and the rights of man could not possibly entertain a doubt of the authenticity of these rules. They exactly corresponded, as does the model on paper, formed by the architect's hand, correspond with the finished house. It was in vain to deny these rules and instructions when all the cunning craft and deed and atrocities prescribed Ascribed, prescribed by these rules were blazoned in the memories of princes, nobles, ministers, and people. Before they could succeed, therefore, in denying the secret instructions, it behoved them to raise from national monuments and national records and all the details of history the deeds of atrocity perpetuated by the Jesuit order in the Old and New World. The Jesuits had been repeatedly charged with acting on secret rules which no eye was allowed to see nor ear to hear. The University of Paris, so far back as 1624, charged it on them that they were governed by secret laws, neither allowed by kings nor sanctioned by parliaments. And in the History of the Jesuits, volume 1, page 326, we find in a letter from the Roman Catholic Bishop of Angelopolis the following. The superiors of the Jesuits do not govern them by the rules of the church, but by certain secret instructions and rules which are known only to those superiors. See the edition of the letter published at Cologne in 1666. In the gradations of the order there were some, as we have already noticed, who were not let into the knowledge of their hidden rules. But there were others who, though admitted into these hidden rules, were not initiated into the most secret regulations. During the civil prosecutions in France brought against the Jesuits by the French merchants to recover from the society the monies lost to them by the Jesuits' mercantile missionaries in Martinico, the fathers at the head of the society were constrained to bring their books into court. This was a most unfortunate matter for them. Their constitutions were now made public. The nation became indignant at the whole sect. The parliament issued their decree, dissolved them, and banished them. But this was not the worst. The contents of this little volume, of which we present a new edition to our readers called Secreta Monita, The Secret Instructions of the Jesuits, was not discovered until about fifty years after their dissolution of the sect in France. These were said to be drawn up by Legnez and Aquaviva, the two immediate successors of Loyola, the founder. When these were first published, the Jesuits were at first overwhelmed with fear, but they immediately affected to be much offended that such rules should be ascribed to them. They publicly denied them. This, of course, was expected. Every criminal pleads not guilty. But their authenticity is not for a moment doubted among all scholars, both papal and Protestant. There is a work in the British Museum entitled Formulae Provisionum Diversarum Agi Passarello Sumo Studio in Unum Collecte, and printed at Venice in 1596. At the end of this book, the secret instructions are found in manuscript. Entered there, no doubt, by some leading and fully initiated Jesuit for his own use. And at the close, there is an earnest caution and an injunction. The caution is that these instructions be communicated with the utmost care only to a very few and those the well tried. 
and the injunction is characteristic. Let them be denied to be the rules of the society of Jesus, if ever they shall be imputed to us. The first copy of the secret instructions was discovered in the Jesuits' college at Paderborn, Westphalia, and a second copy in the city of Prague. In the preface to the, these is found the same injunction as that above. If these rules fall into the hands of strangers, they must be positively denied to be the rules of the society. The discovery of the copy at Paderborn was in this wise as appears from the preface to the English copy published in 1658. When Christian, the Duke of Brunswick, took Paderborn, he seized upon the Jesuit college there, and gave their library, together with all their collections of manuscripts, to the Capuchins. In examining these, they discovered the secret instructions among the archives of the rector. And they, being as were also the other monkish orders, no friends to the Jesuits, brought them before the public. Mr. McGavin, in the Glasgow Protestant, has given us this information of another copy. John Shipper, a bookseller of Amsterdam, bought a copy of the Secret Instructions at Antwerp, among other books, and afterwards reprinted it. The Jesuits, being informed that he had bought the book, demanded it back from him, but he had sent it to Holland. One of the society who lived in Amsterdam, hearing it said by a Catholic bookseller named Van Eyck that Shipper was printing a book which concerned the Jesuits, replied that if it was only the rules of the society, he would be under no concern. Being told it was the secret instructions of the society, the good father shrugged up his shoulders and knitting his brow said that he saw no remedy but denying that this piece came from the society. The reverend fathers, however, thought it more advisable to purchase the whole edition, which they soon afterwards did, some few copies accepted. From one of these was it afterwards reprinted with the account prefixed which is said to be taken from two Roman Catholic men of credit. In 1669, the venerable and learned Dr. Compton, Bishop of London, published an English translation of the secret instructions. His arguments on their authenticity and his character as a scholar and divine are a sufficient guarantee that he would never have given his name and influence to sustain a work of dubious authority or calculated to mislead the public. We have only to add that the last American edition, published at Princeton, and this one, which we publish, are taken from that translation which was published in London in 1723 and dedicated to Sir Robert Walpole, who was afterwards Lord Orford and who had the high honor of being Prime Minister of George I and of George II. All right, folks. That's it. That's the the opening pages of this book. And uh, the rest of it actually has listed the secret instructions of the Jesuits. And uh, if you have any doubt as to who the Jesuits are or what they represent or what they're all about, this should dispel any, uh, you know, doubts of what that may be. So I would encourage people, uh, look this uh, look this book up. You could find it at archive.org. Um, and, you know, just go ahead and do your own research into these things. Look at this, because this is largely one of the biggest secret societies that runs the world today. The Jesuits, they have their fingerprints in everything. And you'll notice uh, that uh, in the history there, you see uh, points when they were disbanded in France. And this is around the same time that they came into disfavor with the public that Adam Weishaupt founded the Bavarian Illuminati. And he was a Jesuit-trained professor of canon law at Ingolstadt University. So there's your direct correlation right there. They, they started branching out into other uh, various secret orders and secret societies and infiltrating other secret societies and getting their fingers all through there. It's admitted in their tactics here. Uh, you know, you, you could see if you just look at the historical record. So uh, just a little bit of eye-opening there for you folks. Uh, I like to uh, read a lot of these types of, of books and, uh, you know, really get a good feel for what's going on in the world because this stuff, folks... People don't talk about it in public. Uh, a lot of these things, these secret writings, are have been hidden from mankind within the secret orders and secret societies for centuries. And it's only because of the advent of the Internet that we're able to actually find these things now. So uh, let's turn the tables on these folks and uh, use the uh, technology that they designed to enslave us to expose them for who they are. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, 
like, and subscribe. Catch you later.